another exciting episode of Tzedakah in the Old Testament. Uh, I am uh, I'm Sheldon Greaves. I'm uh, working with uh, Missy Bird on these uh, series of uh, presentations about uh, charity, the Old Testament, what it has to say about it, and how we might apply some of these ideas or not to some of the problems that are facing us today in terms of poverty, homelessness, and various other things of that sort. Um, I want to first of all thank you for coming out here on a Wednesday evening. Uh, thank you for those of you who brought food. Uh, you keep out doing yourselves. Uh, I've noticed some new faces tonight. If you haven't been able to make the previous ones, uh, they have been video, uh, videotaped, and they are now available on YouTube. Um, you can go to the good, oh, yes. And on the website. And on the Good Sam website, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for making that happen. Um, so what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, a little different from where we've been in the past. Um, we're going to be talking about loans, debt, slavery, and the year of Jubilee, which is a kind of interesting institution in the Old Testament. Before we do that, though, I want to quickly plug something that's coming up in April. Uh, this is going to be held on a series of Sundays. Uh, our uh, own uh, Bill Gaisley is uh, working on that. Bill, do you want to just yeah. say anything? Okay. Okay. So you have a flyer at your table, too. Uh, if you're wondering what Napoleon Bonaparte and Alexander the Great have to do with the development of the Bible, you'll have to come to the class. Um, and just to, to kind of uh, weigh your interest to it, uh, I want to tell you that there are 138,020 words in the Greek New Testament. And I'm going to teach you 9,018 of those words, which is 6.6%. 6 so, are you ready? <laughs> Alright, did anybody know what the, these letters are? Kappa, Alpha, Iota. It's pronounced in the Erasmian pronunciation system, Kai. You now know 6.6% of the Greek New Testament. Uh -huh. it means, what does it mean? It means and. And with that, uh, let, us, uh, let us go on. Loans are essentially the basis, or one of the bases, of our economy. Uh, pretty much every dollar we earn, every dollar that we spend is in effect loaned into existence. That's the way our, our money system works. And it's backed by the promise to repay that loan eventually. Uh, credit, the idea of credit, is thought to have been a relatively recent uh, innovation. Uh, but there is some evidence from ancient Mesopotamia that we'll get to later that, uh, in fact, the idea of credit is very, very old and may, um, uh, it predates the use of coinage by thousands of years, and it now appears that it may even predate the invention of writing itself. Uh, so we'll talk about that just as kind of a fun little tangent. Um, we all use loans. I took out a loan, a couple of loans, um, when I was in college. Fortunately, I was able to pay them back because they weren't terribly large to begin with. And today, things are very much different. Um, this is not the case for a lot of college students who are hit with this double whammy of a huge debt burden when they graduate, and they're graduating into a job market that doesn't have the kinds of jobs that will let them pay down their loans in a, in a reasonable manner. So the student debt bubble is a big problem, it's only going to get worse, and consumer debt is another uh, growing bubble, and it's often a contributing factor to some of the social problems that we've been talking about uh, for the last couple of weeks. Uh, ironically, um, it turns out that it's kind of expensive to be poor, uh, and this is especially true if you're trying to get a loan. Uh, why do the poor pay such high interest rates? Well, uh, they are considered to be greater risks, uh, but also because the return on the loan, if they pay it off, is going to be very big, most likely. They tend to want small amounts. Um, and uh, so the lender takes the profit up front in the, in the form of a, a big interest rate. Um, the uh, poor usually don't have very much uh, the way of collateral, so if there's a, uh, if there's a 
default, the creditor isn't going to get much that way. And, of course, these mechanisms that make loans to the poor profitable for the creditor also increase the risk of default. So it's a kind of self-reinforcing problem. Um, it's also necessary, I think, to point out that some people are poor because they made some, you know, they're not good with money, they don't handle it well, they didn't have a problem with responsibility. Uh, I also, I happen to think, though, that an even bigger contributing factor is the long-term effects of poverty and joblessness. And I know from personal experience that long-term joblessness um, and extended poverty really messes with your mind. Uh, it forces you to play by rules that require short-term thinking at the expense of long-term goals. And there's a lot of research in this area that shows that the disconnect between the expectations of our economic structure and the realities of poverty create this tension that leads to some very serious psychological issues and the kind of fallout that, that happens as a result of that. The other problem is the poor are very vulnerable to predatory lending because they're desperate. Uh, they're more willing to settle for terms that no ordinary businessman would ever accept. And they also lack people in positions of power who will stand up for their rights and keep them from being defrauded. Some of the things that we're going to be looking at in the Bible address these very problems, or at least attempt to. Now, the government, as it's articulated in the Hebrew Bible, is um, very interesting for the kinds of things that they don't mandate. For example, we have a government that has you know, a standing army and law enforcement and all these other institutions that we kind of consider to be indispensable. I mean, it's not a government without these sorts of things. Um, the Bible doesn't mandate any of that. There's nothing about a standing army or law enforcement or any of these sorts of things. There's no description of how the court system is supposed to work or any of that um, sort of stuff. But there is, uh, you know, it's the government, well, prior to the monarchy, things were run to the extent that anyone was running anything um, in an exercise of semi-anarchy. Uh, you see that in the, uh, in the book of Judges, uh, where, you know, every man did what he thought he, you know, thought he wanted to do. Uh, they did, however, this government leave behind a lot of rules about taking care of the poor. So, in that context, this was a very high priority for whatever passed for government in those, in those times. Um, so, um, oh, I got ahead of myself here. So, okay. And, all right. So, one of the ways that uh, certain segments of the population were supported in ancient Israel was through the use of tithes. Now, this was um, uh, a kind of a taking of a portion of the produce of the land to support those parts of society that didn't have access to the capital that was productive farmland. That's what capital was in those days, or at least it served the same role. The two main um, disadvantaged parties that benefited from the tithes were the Levites and the poor. Now, the Levites were the priestly class, and by divine decree, they did not have any land. No land was allocated to them. They had a few cities that were sort of theirs, but their job was to uh, scatter themselves among the rest of the tribes and help to carry out the religious life of the people. That's, that's the basic um, reason. There were others uh, that were a little uh, more theological, but they really don't concern us here. Um, now, these tithes were collected during three annual festivals. There was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths. And these were all harvest-related festivals. And this is how it worked. This is, um, uh, you must be certain to tithe all the produce of your seed that comes from the field year after year. In the presence of the Lord, that means at the temple, uh, your God must eat from the tithe of your grain. That is, you bring it as an offering. Um, and, uh, let's see, uh, your new wine, your olive oil, and your firstborn of herds and flocks in the places 
place uh, he chooses to locate his name so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. Uh, okay, so um, now what could you do with these tithes? Um, this is when he blesses you. If the place he has chosen to locate his name is distant, in other words, if you're far away from the temple and you can't bring the offering to it, uh, you may convert the tithe into money, secure the money, and travel to the place the Lord your God is chosen. So you can use part of your tithe to cover your travel costs to go to uh, go to Jerusalem and offer the rest. Uh, you may also spend the money for however you wish for cattle, sheep, wine, beer, or whatever you desire. You can take that money and you can use it for a kind of personal celebration, uh, which was kind of an interesting thing. This is one of the exceptions to the usual rule of giving it to the Levites or the poor. We get to the Levites. This is don't ignore them. They have no allotment of or inheritance. They don't have any land that they can fall back on. So at the end of every three years, you must bring all the tithe of your produce for that year to the, um, and store it up in your villages. Then the Levites, uh, the resident foreigners, the orphans, and the widows of the villages may come together and eat their fill so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work that you do. Okay, so, so untangle all that. Basically what it means is that the tithes went on a three-year cycle. And the first year... Uh, Everything went to the Levites. The second year, it was mostly this big celebration thing where everybody kind of uh, was able to take the tithes and just consume it themselves. They just did it in the context of a, of a temple celebration. The third year, the Levites got some of it, and oh, there was some for the poor and the orphan and the widow. So the, the tithes were not a real big um, uh, part of the charity, the support that was offered to, to the poor. Um, And uh, this wasn't the only way, obviously, that uh, uh, the Israelites cared for the poor. There was uh, gleaning laws that uh, mandated that the poor had the right to go into a field after it had, harvest, had been harvested. If anything was left, they, could, they had the right to it. And while the field was being harvested, for instance, if you were picking grapes and some of those grapes fell on the ground, you didn't touch it. That was for the poor. You left it there and the, the gleaners would follow along and, and pick it up. Okay, and then also, uh, there was also a commandment that the edges of the field would be left unharvested. And there is some you know, discussion as to how much of a border you leave, but you'd leave a little bit on the edge, and then the poor could come and they could harvest that bit and use that for their food. Um, also, we've, we talked about the uh, sabbatical year, where a, land, a piece of land every seventh year would be left fallow. And if anything happened to grow on it, the poor got that as well. And that um, different pieces of land had different sabbatical years so that there was always some bit of fallow ground that was growing something that someone could, could come in and make use of. Um, it's a fair question to ask, uh, did they actually do this? With respect to tithes and the laws of gleaning, it does appear that this was done fairly regularly. Uh, but it raises an interesting point. The rules for the tithe in the Old Testament don't say anything about enforcement, penalties for non-compliance, or anything of that sort, um, probably because the verb used to describe the collection of tithes uh, actually means to take by force. Um, so tithing was not optional. Uh, it can't be classified as a form of charity, um, and uh, as it often is by modern interpreters. Uh, besides, these tithes were pretty much the only source of income that was allowable for the Levites, and it really would have been a bad idea to leave that up just to the charity of the people. You, you know that's not going to happen well. Um, so, um, the measures that we've seen... seen so far assume that the promised land was uh, sufficiently fertile that uh, and abundant that there was enough for everyone. Uh, these provisions tend to run along distributed lines, these ideas of, of getting food out to people. In fact, the description of the land and its in terms of its fruitfulness, that whole flowing milk and honey thing, was understood to remove the prospect of poverty because there would be enough for everybody. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, 8, 7 through 10 states, this is a land where you will never live in poverty nor want for anything. 
Uh, incidentally, the same might also be said of the Garden of Eden. However, in both cases, humanity still had to work to make and keep that the, those places productive and fertile. Uh, now, we've all encountered this idea that there are, you know, that we find among people who are particularly well off, uh, and it's thought to be this idea that um, the ones who have a lot of wealth are the ones that God blesses. This is uh, the abomination known as the prosperity gospel, and uh, that's based on this idea. But the Old Testament takes a very different view of what blessing with respect to wealth constitutes. It says that blessing means that everyone can sit contentedly under his own vine and fig tree, not just a few. It, the land really isn't blessed or the people aren't blessed until everybody can enjoy uh, these benefits. So um, now I want to go back to this business about credit because this is actually kind of interesting. Um, if you'll indulge me in a little tangent because I find this incredibly fascinating. There, um, some evidence from Mesopotamia was uncovered a number of years ago, uh, back uh, down in the uh, Neolithic horizons of the archaeological record there. So this is very, very old. And uh, these excavations revealed hundreds of small clay objects that just puzzled scholars for years. One archaeologist kind of metaphorically throwing up his hand said they look like nothing except suppositories. Um, however, uh, there was a German scholar by the name of Denise Schwant Besserat who was able to show that these little objects, or tokens as they came to be called, represented part of an accounting system for keeping track of commodities. Different tokens represented different kinds of commodities. So there was one for grain, one for sheep, one for oil, whatever. And these transactions were recorded by placing the tokens inside these hollow clay balls, which uh, modern archaeologists call bulli. And, uh, but then uh, we see a point where somebody hit on the idea of, well, why don't we just take the tokens that are inside the ball and impress them on the outside before we put them in so we know what's in there because you can't see through a ball of clay. And then someone got the even greater idea, well, why have them inside there in the first place? Let's just take a lump of clay, press the tokens into it, and that will be the record of, of what's going on. And these are what are called numeric tablets. And these represent the earliest precursors of what we now call writing. Um, Eventually, uh, these, um, uh, these tokens, these token shapes, uh, after going back and looking at some of the very oldest cuneiform, we now realize that a lot of these cuneiform symbols were influenced by the tokens. They look like the tokens, or they replicate patterns that were found on tokens. So anyway, further study of this demonstrated that these were not transactions in the way that we usually think of them. This was a credit system. We're looking at things that were basically loans, uh, but taken in the form of commodities rather than currency. So this idea that credit is a, is a fairly new thing is, is, no, it's actually probably earlier than, uh, well, definitely earlier than, than currency or coinage, definitely. So, um, so let's talk, uh, let's go back to, uh, let's come forward a couple of thousand years and look at uh, loans to poor in the Hebrew Bible. Um, Deuteronomy lays out two essential points for um, uh, the ancient Israelite social safety net. And the first is, there will never cease to be some poor in the land, therefore I am commanding you to make sure you open your hand to your fellow Israelites who are needy and poor in your land. The second point <coughs> is that by bringing the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, God essentially owns them. He has redeemed them, they are his. That, uh, what they have is by divine favor and grace and not by any intrinsic right of ownership. Everything they have belongs to God, so God has every right to specify how it gets used. We still have that in our liturgy today. Of your own, we have given you. Work is the means by which this abundance finds its way to the people who, who need it. But even the Bible itself, uh, and some, uh, some of the wisdom literature in particular, 
um, acknowledges that even if you work hard and do the right things, um, fortune does not always turn out the way you expect it to. Uh, Ecclesiastes goes into great detail on this. So a few moments ago, we listed some reasons why the poor uh, and lending to the poor carries some extra risk, which is mitigated by charging interest or usury. But the biblical injunction against interest is intended to prevent the concentration of wealth and power. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel goes so far as to claim that the charging of interest is among the worst sins, denouncing it as an abomination and metaphorically portraying users as people who have shed the borrower's blood. Now, Ezekiel is a priest, okay? He's writing from a priestly position, and in addition to being a prophet, and his language here has very specific meaning from the priestly standpoint. Um, to shed blood is, is the priestly, technical, legal definition of murder. So he's, he's basically comparing them to murderers. Uh, an abomination has the technical meaning of any act or set of circumstances that so badly defile the land of Canaan that the land would eject the inhabitants just as it had ejected the Canaanites. Uh, the, the Canaanites were, were thrown out because of their abominations, specifically those things that were offensive to the sanctity of the land. And he's essentially saying, if you commit usury, you're risking the same fate. Okay. So um, there is also some uh, evidence that loans could be secured with collateral uh, but this was subject to regulation. Uh, the collateral could not uh, severely impoverish the debtor to the point where they were subject to undue hardship or, or, um, or personal risk. There's a famous case here uh, quoted in Exodus 22 where if a creditor takes a debtor's cloak as collateral, he has to return it before sunset uh, because otherwise the guy might freeze or, or you know, die of exposure without his cloak. This takes us back to what we talked about on the first lecture, which was this idea that the Old Testament uh, projects of victory of life over death, that death, uh, no death was worth more than a debtor's life, uh, or even their severe discomfort. And there's also a Deuteronomic version of this law, only instead of a cloak, they um, uh, they forbid withholding a millstone, uh, to, which is put up as collateral, since that was an important tool for grinding grain, making bread, eating. So, you know, if you take a millstone as collateral, they still have to have access to using it uh, so that they can still eat. Um, now, the Bible's solution is different, and frankly, it's a tad unsettling. Uh, while the debtor could not be asked to pay interest, collateral could still be claimed uh, in the case of default, uh, and there was also um, the labor of the debtor that could be put up as collateral. This comes perilously close to debt slavery, but the Bible puts strict, strict rules in place to ensure that the relationship between the creditor and the debtor never reaches that point. Um, the, uh, the creditor is entitled to the labor of a debtor who defaults, but only for a limited time. And the debtor may not be treated as a slave, this is explicitly stated, uh, with the usual kinds of harsh treatment or the option to sell the person uh, to someone else. An Israelite who cannot uh, repay a debt is instead taken on as a hireling worker who works for the creditor. Uh, but this is, um, this is not, uh, it's a labor, he's not a, uh, a slave. The, the creditor does not own the person. Um, that said, uh, it wasn't exactly a pleasant life. There are provisions where the creditor can uh, smack his new worker a good one if uh, he doesn't show sufficient motivation or discipline. Uh, the sabbatical year, all that goes away. Uh, every seven years when the sabbatical year happens, if you're a hireling, you're released. So there is, you know, it can't happen for longer than six years. In addition, um, so that the arrangement could never be permanent. Uh, one interesting innovation, though, is that when the defaulted debtor 
finally did uh, get released due to the sabbatical year, the law stipulates that they receive some fresh capital with which to make a new start. So he will not, you will not let him go empty-handed. You will furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your wine press. You get wine, that's cool. Uh, and the Lord God has blessed you. Uh, as the Lord God has blessed you, you shall give to him. Now, imagine for a moment, if you will, uh, if instead of putting prison inmates to work for some third-party corporation where they basically get nothing, suppose prisoners were able to work with an arrangement where the proceeds of their labor got put into a fund which would then be released to them upon their release from prison. Think about that. They could then take this lump of capital and go on and really make a fresh start. Uh, you know, it's one thing not to be cooped up in a cell. That's, you know, uh, that, uh, that's a pretty low bar for, you know, getting started. Uh, but, you know, imagine that. That would be, that would be pretty cool, I think. Um, before we go to the Jubilee, there's a couple of other things that I just want to quickly shoehorn into our discussion here. Uh, some innovations that I thought were kind of uh, were interesting. One of them is that Hebrew laborers were paid at the end of every workday, before sundown. This removes the need for payday lending, mostly. Um, Hebrews who had lived to see one jubilee year were entitled to free land. So, we, as we said earlier, land is capital. This would be another way for people to get kind of a new start in life or to expand or to kind of rejigger their, um, uh, their lives. Uh, but uh, anyway, we're going to leave that now. We're going to uh, move on to um, the Jubilee. Uh, the basis of the Jubilee, as we said before, well, as we insinuated before, was that the land belongs to God. Um, and it must not become the property of someone else, uh, someone other than the person to whom God gave it. So Leviticus 25, uh, 23 the land must not be sold without reclaim because the land belongs to me. For you are foreigners and residents with me. Remember the first week we talked about the resident alien. Well, God's saying, Israelites, guess what? You're resident aliens as far as I'm concerned. All right. So uh, you treat them the way I you know, would treat you. So the division of the land among the Israelites is described in mind-numbing detail in the book of Numbers where each tribe is allotted their share. Uh, the point of that section is not only to show which tribe has what lands, but to steadily reinforce the notion that God is literally their landlord and that they are tenants on that land. So you're probably aware that uh, the Jubilee is, is essentially the sabbatical year writ very large. Every seventh sabbatical year was a jubilee year. Well, there's some debate whether it happened every 49 years or after the uh, seventh uh, sabbatical year, there was an additional year that was the jubilee year making the 50th year. So anyway, uh, that's another discussion. Uh, in addition to the usual features of the sabbatical year, such as canceling debts and releasing hirelings, the jubilee year included a provision for landowners who had been uh, required or needed to sell some of their land or all of their land in order to cover debts or relieve their poverty. Uh, that land was by mandate to return back to its original owner. So just to be clear, this is different from the debts that were forgiven in the usual Sabbath year. Yes, those, uh, there were those, but those debts did not involve the sale of land. That was just for the, for the Jubilee year. Um, the Jubilee year um, created some relief for landowners to prevent them from reaching the point where they lost all title to the land. So it didn't all happen at once. There were stages that you could go through. And these are um, uh, described in uh, Leviticus 25. The first uh, stage is that a person would simply become poor. Uh, the presumed scenario is that a farmer borrows money to buy seed, but they didn't harvest enough to repay the loan. 
So he has to sell some of his land to a buyer in order to cover the debt and to buy seed for the next planting. If there was a person who belonged to the farmer's clan who wished to act as a redeemer, they could pay the buyer according to the number of remaining crops that were, you know, that could be expected before the Jubilee year. And uh, then at that point, it would revert back to the farmer. Uh, until that time, the land belonged to the redeemer, so it stayed in the family, uh, who allowed the farmer to work it. The second um, stage was that uh, if you assume the land was not redeemed and the farmer again fell into debt from which he couldn't recover, uh, he would forfeit all the land to the creditor, and the creditor must, however, lend the farmer the funds necessary to continue working as a tenant farmer on his own land. So he's not a slave, he's a tenant farmer. He still gets to stay on his land. Um, and he can't charge him interest. That, of course, is a no-no. The farmer would amortize this loan with, profit, with the profit made from the crops, uh, perhaps eliminating the debt, maybe. Uh, if so, the farmer would regain his land. If the loan was not fully repaid before Jubilee, at that time the land would revert back to the farmer or his heirs. The third option, was that the debtor would become uh, temporarily bound as a, uh, a laborer to, um, to, the, uh, to the creditor, and it would be kind of like becoming a hireling uh, for paying the debt. Uh, and as a bound laborer, he would work for wages, and everything that he made would go towards the repayment of his debt. At the end, of the, at the Jubilee year, he'd regain his land, he'd regain his freedom, uh, throughout all these years, however, the creditor explicitly must not work him as a slave, sell him as a slave, or rule over him harshly. The creditor must fear God uh, by accepting the fact that all of God's people are essentially God's slaves, uh, whom he has graciously brought out of Egypt, and no one can own them because God already does. Uh, so, uh, this now brings us to the question, do they really do this? Scholars go back and forth on this. Uh, they're hesitant to say, really, one way or the other, that the Jubilee year was actually carried out. My guess is that if it did happen, it was pretty rare. This is understandable. Uh, the evidence just isn't there one way or the other. However, there is a passage that is pretty significant in Jeremiah, in which he claims that the failure to keep the Jubilee on at least one occasion was a pivotal moment in Judah's history and was directly responsible for its demise. And I will give this in full because it's very important. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to make a proclamation of liberty to them that all should set free their Hebrew slaves, male and female, so that no one should hold another Judean in slavery. And they obeyed all the officials and all the people who had entered into the covenant that all would set free their slaves, male and or female, so that they would not be enslaved again. They obeyed and set them free, but afterwards they turned about and took back the male and female slaves they had set free and brought them again into subjection as slaves. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the, the God of Israel, I myself made a covenant with uh, your ancestors when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, saying, every seventh year, each of you must set free any Hebrews who have been sold to you and have served you for six years. You must set them free from your service. But your ancestors did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. You yourselves recently repented and did what was right in my sight by proclaiming liberty to one another. And you have made a covenant before me in the house that is called by my name. But then you turned about and profaned my name when each of you took back your male and female slaves whom you had set free according to their desire. And you brought them again into subjection to be your slaves. Therefore, says the Lord, you have not obeyed me by granting a release to your neighbors and friends I am going to grant a release to you, says the Lord, a release of, to the sword, to pestilence, and to famine. I will make you a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Subtle, huh? Um, 
Now, this passage does not actually claim that Jubilee was kept as a matter of course. It does make clear that it was not kept, uh, at least on one particular occasion when it really mattered. Uh, there's another instance that we should also take note of, and that is the first public oration by uh, Jesus of Nazareth in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, in which he called for an acceptable year of the Lord. That's almost the first thing out of his mouth. Acceptable year of the Lord is another way of referring to the year of Jubilee. Uh, he says, we bring that back, we're going to bring that back. And this uh, is remarkable for a number of reasons, but in this case we should note that the reaction of those present was, present was to decide to stone him to death for even suggesting such a thing. Um, so um, it's possible that, like the Leverett marriage, uh, the Jubilee year was just one of those popular policies that nobody liked, uh, and at least within certain segments of the population. Now, on the other hand, um, there are some scholars who have noted that as you go through the legislation, in Leviticus, uh, you find that these stipulations are very detailed. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, in this case, this, in that case, something else. Um, this suggests, the argument goes, that this policy was tried on a few occasions and that these refinements that we find in the text are kind of the efforts to make it all work, uh, to smooth off the rough corners, find places where it didn't work out, didn't make sense, and try to make it uh, fairer and more palatable. Um, we don't know. You know, we just don't know. Uh, but it's, you know, kind of understandable given current attitudes why this might be a not terribly popular thing. However, um, there are some things that have been inspired uh, currently by the idea of Jubilee. Uh, one of them is something called Rolling Jubilee. This was something that grew out of Occupy Wall Street. Rolling Jubilee was created to help deal with unpayable medical debt. Bad debt is routinely sold on the open market to collection agencies for pennies on the dollar. And then they try to collect what they can, try to collect on the uncollectible, and usually they can get enough to, to make a profit, um, usually by being really nasty people doing all kinds of horrible things. Rolling Jubilee, on the other hand, set up a company which purchased bad debt on the open market for pennies on the dollar, but instead of uh, attempting to collect it, they made the debt go away. Now, in addition to purchasing the debt, they had to set up a nonprofit organization whose sole function was to accept donations of debt. The reason they did this is because if they simply forgave the debt, it would be counted as income to the debtors, and they'd have to pay taxes on it. Um, this kind of helps highlight some of the unfairness in our credit system, because banks and most corporations don't have to check this. They can just make it go away with the stroke of a pen. Uh, but by donating the debt to their nonprofit organization, Rolling Jubilee was able to bypass the income. Now, in June of 2016, uh, John Oliver, you know, on his show last week tonight, uh, did a kind of experiment. They had heard about this, so they tried doing this. And um, they were able to set up a company, and for a relatively trivial sum, they were able to take, uh, to acquire $15 million in bad medical debt and make it evaporate. Um, I am frankly fascinated by this idea, not just of this particular instance, but this idea of using the system against itself in order to obtain relief for the vulnerable, um, there's a certain artistry to it that I find just <laughs> wonderful. Um, and I also suspect that there are probably other ways to game the system that way. Uh, I don't know what they are, uh, but you know, I suspect that um, some creative brainstorming with some devious and subversive minded people <laughs> with conscience uh, might be able to come up with some uh, some interesting ideas that would prove very fruitful. So thank you. Uh, we'll uh, take a quick break and then we'll go on and uh, get started with this. As per our regular routine, I'm going to
like to give you the good news about today. Um, one of my students actually left class crying on Monday, so it's really healthy. It's going to be okay. I don't know, maybe we'll. Anyway, hi. Um, so, to sort of set the stage, I found this um, really amazing handout. Um, I was uh, searching for ways that um, people of faith can talk about debt and poverty. And one of the questions, a couple of the questions that they asked, and then a few other questions that policy advocates have come up with, really, I think, set the stage for how we make assumptions about people who are in poverty. And so, um, when you go to the grocery store, you have to pay attention to the cost of the items you purchase, not because you're trying to stay within a budget, because, but because you have so few dollars with which to spend your money. Uh, have you ever had to pay attention to what the items cost and then walk away? So you have to make decisions about which food you can buy for your family. Have you put medical expenses on a credit card and then had to take lots of time to pay off that credit card? Um, have you, do you carry a balance on a credit card or multiple credit cards? As most people, and we'll get into this a little bit, but most people in America have multiple credit cards. And then is your monthly rent or mortgage payment more than 30% of your monthly gross income? When we're talking about um, uh, poverty and debt and consumer protections, we tend to be going on some old financial assumptions in America that are based in sort of this old traditional family system, traditional family system, of uh, your, your monthly mortgage or rent payment should only be a certain percentage of your income, and then you should have a certain percentage of food, and then a certain percentage of debt, and you want to get that paid off as fast as possible. And I mean, this is what I learned from my grandma and grandma, right? so, but um, we're going to talk a little bit about how that reality is just almost non-existence for a majority of Americans today and how we really need to think about and rethink about, as people of faith, how we are going to really seriously look at the economic position of many of the people here, not only in America, but in Corvallis in particular. So um, the average American household that is carrying credit card debt has a balance of over $15,000, nearly $16,000 in credit card debt. And that can be from multiple credit cards. And I found this cartoon today, and I was like, yeah, that's so good. So um, it took a lot of work, but it's back up to 2008 levels. What could go wrong? Yeah. And we're going to talk about that because lots of things have happened in the last two years that could go very wrong. So households with any kind of debt owe about $131,000 that includes a mortgage. And so that's car payments, um, credit cards, houses, student loans. Um, student loans have become almost a staple in uh, families who um, haven't been to college in the last 20 years. So, uh, so there's a few key issues that I want to touch upon that have created this system. So over the last 10 years, uh, what has happened is that costs have increased, but we're still looking at incomes that in some states are at the 1970s level. So people's incomes in many states are not rising as they should to counter the cost of inflation and the cost of housing and the increases in food and our increases in medical costs. So for the baby boomers, because the boomers are aging, um, medical costs have gone up extensively. Plus there's um, a whole generation of young people that never had insurance until the ACA passed so their medical costs have also gone up. And so, but income growth only grew about 20%. One of the things that um, Jim and I noticed when we moved here was how inexpensive food is, because we don't have the tax on food. In California, it cost us nearly three times as much to feed our kids as it does here in Oregon. And I mean, I still can't believe that California is even, that people are still living there. Not because I want them all to come here, because I really don't. I'm not from California, so I get to say that. But, um, stay away. But the cost of living in states like California, and Washington is becoming this way too, and even parts of Portland, is becoming just untenable for people. It's almost impossible to, 
to pay your bills. And so, and it's because income is not growing with the cost of everything else. And so it's a critical piece to having this conversation. Um, so if we're talking about different types of debt here in the United States, uh, this is uh, the total amount of debt that's owned by the average United States household and what type it is. So we talked about credit cards and mortgages, but we have auto loans and student loans and then any type of debt combined which gets you into the hundreds of thousands. What that accounts for is nearly $1.2 trillion in auto loans um, and $12.96 trillion of any type of debt. So, and that's us as the American populace. That's not the American government or the state government's debt. That's our own personal debt. And what we are starting to see, um, what's that? When you said any type of debt, Right, so that's like what any, that that's the average any type of debt in a combined household. So that could be medical, credit card, whatever is left on your mortgage and an auto loan put together as one. Is higher than that. Right, mortgage is higher than that, but if you've paid off part of your mortgage, that's how they define any type of debt. Or you live in an apartment. That's the average. This is based on many median. So the point, the point that I really um, am trying to make here is that um, what we have seen, what we saw from, t from the crash in 2008 to now, to 2016, was an aggressive approach to regulating in favor of the consumer. So we put into place at the federal level consumer protections that would make it so that people who were facing these huge debt loads, and this is 2017 numbers here. So people who were facing those large debt loads from in 2008 that caused the economy to crash had a whole bunch of protections put into place with the, with the um, development of an organization called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And the sole purpose of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was to address the huge debt that people were facing in 2008. And what happened was they delivered $12 billion in consumer relief by negotiating with mortgage companies, credit card companies, auto companies, um, to help people get out from that debt burden so that they could survive with their families. What has happened now, as of 2017, is that the new um, budget that has been proposed from the administration cuts the entire budget of the CFPB to eliminate the office completely. And the new director has said the justification is that it unduly burdens financial institutions to have that credit bureau, that bureau in place. And the interim leader, Mick Mulvaney, has called it a slow cancer and a joke, and he's the one who's directing the Bureau. So keeping a close eye, potentially, on what happens with the Financial Protection Bureau is going to be critical as we look at how people are able to move forward under these mountains of trillions of dollars of debt. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau used to take about three to five actions a month in lawsuits and regulation and ensuring that people had protections and or were able to address their debt issues, and that number has gone down to zero. So they are no longer enforcing actions against banks and other um, big business companies in order to help people get out from this trillions of dollars of debt. With the total household debt, which includes all of the debt that was listed on the previous slide, it hit just under $13 trillion in the third quarter of last year after rising by $116 billion in the third quarter of 2017. The Fed noted that this figure is $280 billion higher than the previous record set in the third quarter of 2008. So I'm just going to let that sink in for just a second. <laughs>
any idea why? I mean, with the economy improving, are, are people going full hog and just buying stuff? I mean, or the economy is not actually improving for people who have carry large debt loads or who live at the edge of poverty. So I'm going to get into that in a minute. But the economy is improving for people who are not carrying high debt because their incomes are, are steadily increasing. So it's people who are the working poor who are not experiencing that higher level of income distribution. So their incomes are still staying low um, as compared to people who have higher paying jobs and who tend to carry less debt. So I want to bring this home to Corvallis a little bit. So in Corvallis, according to all the numbers, um, the median home sales price is around three hundred forty-six thousand. The median rental price is around seventeen ninety-five, and this is for a three-bedroom home. And but the median household income is forty-three thousand. So rent in Corvallis is about forty percent of your household income um, if you're renting a house. Uh, with three bedrooms. So what that means for a family like ours, who requires four bedrooms, if we don't want fighting with the children, <laughs> which can you believe our little angels fight? Just kidding. Um, it's around $2,000 a month. So the bigger the family, the bigger the house, that's about what you're looking at in Corvallis for rent. And as we all know, it's really hard to buy a house for because there's just not a lot of housing on the market to buy. Um, so that's what that looks like. So what I want to point out here is that we have been taught, I know I was taught this my whole life, that you spend a fixed percentage of your income on housing, that you have a certain percent and you're not supposed to go over because that's bad budgeting. And the general recommendation, as I mentioned earlier, is about 30% of your gross monthly income. So if you're making $4,000 a month, you're paying about $1,200 in rent. And, and here what we're seeing is that that's just not simply the case. And in almost every place in America, it's nearly impossible to spend less than 40% of your income on housing. And what they are finding, I will um, have this link in my notes, but there is a wonderful frontline uh, on PBS did a really incredible uh, one hour frontline on poverty and affordable housing and there too talked about how even when you're poor you still have to spend more than 40% of your income on rent even if you are on uh, getting Section 8. So you still, so much of your income has to come from your welfare and it's still over 40%. Because housing prices have gone up, rental prices have gone up, but our incomes have not gone up. So does that all make sense? We have to change, I think part of our conversation when we're talking about this, is really changing this framework we have in our heads that good, responsible adults only pay 30% of their income for housing. Because good, responsible adults can barely make enough money to pay 30% of their housing. and so. As we are looking past our judgment of, of people who are insecure in their housing or insecure in um, their ability to provide for their families, I think it's really important to change that, that old tape we have playing in our head. And there are a couple of things that have been done recently um, that also directly impact what poverty looks like. Um, in America. And so this table here is the new um, 2018 poverty guidelines um, in the contiguous United States. They, they're adjusted for Hawaii, Alaska, and Puerto Rico. But essentially, my family, um, which is, I have a family of five, uh, our poverty line per year, so that's the line they look at to judge whether or not we're at or below poverty. So Jim and I would have to make 29000 a year or below to be at that poverty level. Um, we're not far over that, actually, ironically. Um, but in Corvallis in particular, 31.4% of the population here falls below the poverty line. Part of that is because we have students, right? 
But part of that um, is also because we live in sort of this odd, just slightly larger than rural city. So a, a rural city in Oregon is considered a population of 40,000. We have 56. We also have these outlying areas where people are coming, you know, people are here to go to school and try to make something of themselves, and they come from other parts of the state to go to OSU, but they still are coming from impoverished areas throughout the state and the country. And so this poverty line is not, it's not odd um, as far as our population and what our population looks like. And I think um, we need to really be careful about language, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the language of um, the banking system and how they use language. But poverty is defined, like when you just Google, what is, what is the meaning of poverty, as a state of being extremely poor, but also the state of being inferior in quality or insufficient in amount. And I think that very often that's how we talk about poor people. We talk about people as being insufficient and as being less than and being inferior. And I think we need to really caution ourselves in how we think about people who may not be where we are, um, but they, there's a story, and you and I were just talking about listening to people's stories of who were getting out of prison, right? Like we were having a conversation earlier. And there is a story behind the way people are living their lives. And I think we have a wonderful opportunity as a faith community to start to ask people their stories and find out where they're at and why they're there and figure out how we can help them rise to together and collaborate to figure out, I don't know if the Rolling Jubilee is the answer, but I sure do like it, to really talk about how we see people who are in poverty and really see them and, and inquire how they got to where they're at. Because I think now, in today's America, you see all the documentaries and you hear all the talk about how people are one paycheck away from right, living in their cars. And that's very, very true for a majority of families, especially families with young kids. And it's because, again, the incomes are not rising the way everything else is rising. The cost of housing and food. So, the Labor de Department, so several things have happened in the last 12 months that are of note that are affecting people in poverty in particular. The Labor Department has delayed the full implementation of a rule that requires financial advisors to act in a client's best interest. So starting in 2008, we had a regulation that said that if you are a financial advisor, you can't act in your best interest. You have to act in your client's best interest. And in the last year, they've delayed the full implementation of that rule, which was supposed to come into fruition in the last 12 months. The Department of Education has withdrawn the regulations that are meant to protect students. And so there were several regulations that were put into place to protect students who have student loan debt, which if you're going to medical school can end up being in the hundreds of thousands. And um, they have withdrawn all those regulations that were meant to protect students who were experiencing that debt. They also have delayed forgiving student loans of students who have been defrauded by for-profit colleges. So there was also a law that was passed that said the Department of Education had to forgive student loans for people who had been defrauded by private colleges or for-profit colleges and the, that that process is also being delayed. Also, um, lawsuits have been dropped against payday lenders under the new Mick Mulvaney and the new and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They were supposed to. They were there were several lawsuits against payday lenders, some of whom were charging interest rates as high as nine hundred and fifty percent. And if you have to use a payday lender to get money to feed your kids because that's all you have left, and you are getting charged 950% on your next paycheck, you're never going to see that paycheck or the paycheck after or the paycheck after. And those payday lenders, so all of those restrictions from 2008 to 2016, 
the lawsuits are going away, and they're rolling back the regulations on those on the lenders. So we will start to see an upsurge of those lenders, and they target. They're so good at their targeting. They're just, and I have met their lobbyists in my former career, and God, they're good. I mean, they are so good at what they do. It's unbelievable. So that is something to keep an eye on, I think. Just as a community, those are the kinds of things that we certainly don't want to see in Corvallis, but I think all over they just are devastating for people. Um, also, the 1977 Community Reinvestment Act um, required the lowering of, required lowering Bates performance ratings for charging high fees and steering minorities into subprime mortgages, um, which could lead to increased discrimination. So one of the things that happened was we started um, in 2008 really targeting banks and lenders who were um, unfairly discriminating against people of color in particular, and also women. And they've reduced all those consumer protections. And then the language here, I think, is really critical. So. When they decided to um, remove the, the oversight on banks um, discriminating against people and minorities, the language that the business community used what they, was that they're reducing rules and avoiding new ones, which is a big win for American business. And we will see that business will begin bearing fruit. And the reason I want to pay attention to the term begin bearing fruit in particular is because certainly my family and many other families, especially the 30% of people living below the poverty, out of the poverty line in Corvallis, are not going to be bearing fruit. And they will become victims of the fruit of those businesses, especially the big banks. And also in that film that um, was on Frontline, one of the things the bank, there was this representative from Key Bank that was part of the story that got interviewed. And they were talking about housing tax credits because builders can get housing tax credits if a certain percentage of the building is for low income housing in Section 8, right? So they asked him about the tax credit industry at an industry conference. And his exact words were business is booming, it's never been better. Because there's so many people that need affordable housing, that that is why the banks are making, and the, the builders and the construction companies are making a fortune. And his language was so haunting to me. Business is booming, it's never been better. And that means that people who are in banking businesses and in the lending business are making a fortune off of affordable housing and building those big complexes but at the same time, nearly 25% of people who um, require Section 8 housing vouchers cannot get one. And there's no regulation. In Oregon, there's a regulation that you cannot discriminate based on Section 8 housing. But in other places throughout the country, you can discriminate. You don't have to let somebody into your apartment complex for having, if they have Section 8. And so, and in Oregon, there's no regulation mechanism in place. And so several people in my class um, who are going to school and who have Section 8 or whose families do, their families can't find apartments, even though they're not supposed to be discriminated against because the, the enforcement mechanism has been very good. So I think it's really important to listen to language. And then one of the last things that I really want to say um, is that 56% of households in Corvallis are renters. And that's because of the school, for sure. Um, but the average household size in Corvallis is 2.3 persons. So it's not just students that are renting. Um, just one more Fifty-five percent of households who rent are are, fight, are rent overburdened in Corvallis. So that means that almost more than half of people who rent in Corvallis are rent overburdened and can't afford to pay their rent. So 
There's hope. I have no idea what it is. Like this is the first time where I have like done a policy analysis and I've looked at things and I'm not really sure because I think there may have been had they not started deregulating everything. Because while too many regulations is bad, and I agree with that. I mean, I was raised in a very moderate environment. Too many regulations is bad. It doesn't, it doesn't allow for growth for business. Under Dodd-Frank, credit unions for sure suffered because Dodd-Frank was very heavy-handed and, and there were parts of it that were not well thought out. But deregulating the big, big, huge banks that caused us to go into the turmoil in 2008 when we have over $260 billion in debt, which is way more than we had in 2008, is also bad. And having no regulations disproportionately affects poor people, women, and people of color. And I think we really have to consider that as we're having this conversation. And I think together we have got to come up with the solutions. And I don't know, I really don't know what they are. Because if you even look into the affordable housing industry, they still take advantage of, of people who can't afford a single family dwelling. And I just think there's so many pieces to this puzzle that I certainly can't present in 30 minutes. Um, and I really, I mean, I, a little goes a long way, but I'm not sure what the little is. And with all of this debt, I'm just not sure. So and maybe that's my own overwhelm, I don't know. But, and listening to my students, my students are just so inundated with their financial loans and you know their student loan debt, trying to do the best that they can to get a master's degree. I want to do something, but they, it's, it's a really odd conundrum. And, I, and going back to what Sheldon said, like, he had this piece on his slide that said, interest was considered a dangerous, deadly sin on par with murder. <laughs> Charging people 900% for a paid in loan <laughs> so falls into that category. Charging people 25% on anything falls into that category. But anyway, that's kind of, I'm, I'm just not feeling very optimistic about this one.